Well, hello and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine and RecoveryTodayMagazine.com, where first and foremost, we are a magazine of hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or for a loved one, or you're actively in recovery a short time or maybe many, many years, you're going to find all kinds of information on all related topics of addiction, recovery, and really living a happy and successful sober life. My name is Rob Hanley. I'm the producer of Recovery Today magazine. I love what I do because I get to talk to super cool people like my guest today, Tony Mandarich. Tony uh, it was a former NFL, American football NFL uh, pro tackle, offensive tackle, uh, he played in the National Football League for seven years. He was drafted in the first round. I think he was the second pick in the 1989 uh, uh, pick or the draft by the Green Bay Packers. Uh, he was also he played for the Indianapolis Colts uh, as well for several years. But there's a lot more to this story. I remember because we're about the same age. I remember him on the cover of Sports Illustrated because the guy is a monster, like six six and nine hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> muscle, so ridiculous. But his story is a rocky kind of story: triumph, tragedy, and then getting it together, and then triumph again. And now he's super cool. He's got a. We'll get into everything. So Tony was so excited to uh, to talk with you and, and get to know you a little bit. Thanks so much for for jumping out, man. It's a pl- it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to. Um, be able to share the story and, 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 you know, going to the website and going through the magazine, I wasn't familiar with it. Um, but then, you know, I started going through it and I was like starting to read stories and I was like super interested. I'm like, okay, another story that's exactly like mine, just some circumstances were different, right? Like, like yeah. because of their job or because of what they were, they were a soccer mom, but 90% of the story I relate to. Yeah. And, and then, you know, three hours go by and you're like, I need to stop reading this and get some work done <laughs> because, you know, all these different that. stories are so interesting. So you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure and, and thanks for asking me. Hey, you're more than welcome. I say the goal, and I think I told you this before we, uh, you know, we were setting this up, was every single piece of content in Recovery Today magazine must have an uptick an underlying theme of hope because we're dealing with such dark stuff. Mm-hmm. And then there should be some kind of takeaway if possible, like something I didn't know, whether it was some alternative therapy or whatever, mm-hmm. different kind of thing that somebody can go, wow, I never th- knew that or I never thought about that. But um, I love the, uh, you know, everybody loves a Rocky story, man. Mm-hmm. So it's so, so cool. So again, thank you. Let me just kind of jump in, I guess, mm-hmm. with the soft, most softball question. Like, so kind of give us some, tell us your story a little bit, man. Like, you know, like. Well, it's so, it's so interesting that you mentioned the Rocky thing, the story, because of the Rocky movie, the original Rocky movie. Yep. Um, was a, it was a catalyst for me. Rocky, and I think Rocky came out in 1976. I was 10. Yep. And I think Pumping Iron, the documentary with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Franco Colombo, the weightlifting and going to, you know, the, being a pro bodybuilder, what that's all about behind the scenes and going to the shows that came out in 77. Now those two movies were the, like the catalysts for me to start making decisions. It was, it was, it, so you think about it, you're 10, 11 years old. Like when I saw Rocky, you know, there was no Netflix. There was no, I, there was no, <laughs> there was no, Hey, I'll just watch it on TV. I want to say I made my dad. I didn't make my dad do anything. I asked my dad, can you take me so I can go see the Rocky movie? And, and he, you know, he was, he was awesome. My dad's awesome. And uh, so he drove me to the local theater, dropped me off. I watched the Rocky movie, uh, middle of the day. Um, I did that five days in a row. <laughs> it, it, was, it impacted me that much. And... After that fifth day, because uh, I believe it was, I, I watched it, uh, first time I watched it was on a Monday, and then the last, it was all consecutive days, Friday was the last day, and I asked them Friday if, if we could go to the mall, because I wanted to buy gray sweats and a gray, and a gray hoodie, and I had running shoes, and uh, middle of winter, in a little, little town, actually, it was a little town called Milton, Ontario, it's now pretty big, uh, 45 minutes from downtown Toronto. But at that time, it was small, and then we lived even outside of Milton on a farm, 25-acre apple farm. 
We lived on Fifth Line, and Fifth Line was a gravel road. And Steeles Avenue was the main artery. So from our farm to Steeles Avenue was like two miles. So I would jog. I would get all hooded up and everything. I would jog to the Steeles, turn around, and jog back every day. Did you drink the eggs? No, I didn't. No. Um, no. <laughs> I can't lie. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I didn't think that that was the key. <laughs> Unfortunately, later in life, I thought other things were the key that almost right, killed me. Right, right. <laughs> but, but that was like, you know, for a 10-year-old to do that, when I think back, like my youngest daughter is 21, Brittany. And 11 years ago, when I looked at her, and I didn't say anything to her about it, because she had heard the story before. But I thought to myself, 10, 11, it was really towards 11, I thought, that that's when I made a career decision. And when you look at an 11-year-old today, I was probably, like, they're probably, for the most part, the same. I mean, they're a little bit more maybe vain because of all the selfies and stuff, but at the core, an 11-year-old and an 11-year-old, yeah. especially if you go in the Midwest. And that's a pretty young age. I couldn't believe how young an age that was, and there I was making a career decision on paper. Yeah. Um, literally a pad of paper, drew a line down the middle with a pen wow. and, and wrote pros, cons, and this is what I want to do. And, and then... Literally wrote the so that timeline. That was playing in the NFL. That was playing in the NFL. That was the end game. Yeah. Were you playing football already? Never. Wow. Neighborhood pick up football. Like oh, I say neighborhood. Although we were on a farm, me and like three of the neighbors that were like lived within six miles of each other would get together in a farm field and play two on two. Wow. So, so one was a quarterback and one was a receiver, right? One was a yeah. uh, you know DB. Five Mississippi rusher, right. and the other one was was the, the DB. Yep. Um, and then I put, and then I started playing soccer, uh, and I think I, I played soccer for eight years, and I know for a fact soccer, in a major way, um, helped my athletic ability, because you're constantly you're constantly moving, but then at times it's like bursts of speed and changing direction, and it's such a good, like, it's almost like a good drill. I don't want to, I mean, soccer is the most popular sport internationally. Yeah. Um, but it was, when I look back at all the stuff that led up to it and what went perfectly planned, what went as planned, but was not the right plan, and then, you know, and then what you do about it. Um It's just, I find it unique. I, I felt that everybody thought that way. And it doesn't make me special. It just makes it because, I mean, I'm made of the same chemicals that you are, the carbon and the oxygen and all that stuff and, uh, you know, hydrogen, I think. I don't know. I'm, some chemist is going to email me and say, you dummy, it's not. <laughs> aren't, we, aren't we made of kryptonite or something? <laughs> we thought we were. <laughs> um, but I thought everybody thought that way. And even today, you know, um, it's, Rob, I can tell you today, and I'll bet you can relate to this from sure. talking to you on the phone and from, uh, you know, last week and talking to you today, I'll bet you can relate to this. There are certain things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that you're like, okay, okay, uh, there's an issue, a problem, whatever, okay, we got to solve it. So let's figure out some solutions. Now let's dissect the solutions and let's pick the best solution, most efficient, that's best for everybody or the company or me personally or the family or the kid or, or, or your, doesn't matter what it is. And then let's execute it. And all that is done sometimes in 60 seconds and sometimes it's done in an hour, just depending on what the situation is. And so I always felt that every like doesn't everybody think like that? And as I grow older, or I should say, 
I don't want to say wiser. <laughs> As I grow more experienced yeah. in life, I find that not the the minority, or I shouldn't say minority, but forty nine percent or less think that way. Um, I remember being that age, and so it doesn't surprise me how cool is it that you're like, you probably can relate to this, so I definitely can. And um, the difference is you did it, though, for what I'll say, is I remember literally being 10 or 11 years old. I think I was watching baseball. I don't really watch any baseball Mm -hmm. right now. I like to go to a game once in a while. But I played baseball a little bit, and um, I remember thinking I could be a pro baseball player. Mm-hmm. Like I had this presence to think like there I have window I have a window of opportunity at like that age I was thinking I had it all mapped out like mm-hmm. literally if I did such and such and I literally devoted and practiced and did such and such I am young enough that by the time I'm 17 or 18 I would go to be good enough to go to yeah. college yeah. and I could put myself on this trajectory and I remember going out in the backyard for an hour swinging the bat and holding four bats and putting a donut on it and stuff like that. The problem a little bit, or the difference between you and I and that distinction is I didn't continue, and you obviously did. But I look at my life now at our relative Mm -hmm. uh, age about the same, and I think, like, you know, I'm too old now to play in the NFL, so, like, that will, that's gone. Really, the NFL is too young. Yeah, I can't. You're not too old. The NFL is too young. Right, I can't be a uh, I can't be a fighter pilot like I that was one of the other things like when I was in, in my later teens I'm thinking I'm going to be a fighter pilot that's gone, but at the same time although there are so I'm not going to be the pre- you know there's many things I mean I guess I could because they're they're usually old but there's still so many things the possibilities are still even for today I mean the good thing if somebody's listening or watching right now anybody who it would be is like number one you're alive. And so because you're alive and you actually have the presence to watch this, to think for whatever it would be, to look in the magazine to see this interview, like the possibilities are still like infinite. You could be a zillionaire if that's what you wanted to be. You could start a foundation. You could, you could, you could, you could. If you're practically homeless, you could get married, have a house, have a car. Maybe it's something small. But the difference with you is that you mapped it all out and did it. So, yeah, go, continue. Go on, man. But you're right well, on point with me. Being tan- Having something tangible for me, okay, so um, paper, right? And, and uh, even today, I'll use this over the phone because the phone's not tangible. Even though it is a product that you can hold, when you put the words on that digital screen, they're not tangible to me. Mm-hmm. And that may be because of the era I grew up that we grew up in. Mm-hmm. And I even prefer to do this on paper with a pencil. But it's hard to come across a pencil. <laughs> you know, it, it's like you got to literally go out and buy them, like at a, you know, at, a, at an office supply store. But here's one of the coolest things I think. I think it's extremely important. Like, like what I have done. Um, is important. It was important. It was, it was, at the time it was great. Okay. And I acknowledge that. Okay. But I don't dwell on it. I don't live off of it. I don't define myself by it. And I, but I do try to use it to its advantage for what happened later in life. Mm. So, so I do use that. To get into the door, and it's and some doors are easier to get into when you have that history. Totally. And and it's amazing. And here's the best part. You and I, just like anybody listening to this or watching this or when they read it, anybody. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care. I don't care what the situation is. I can still do greater things than I have ever done in my life forward. And to me, it matters. What are you doing today? Yeah. Because what you do today is what happens tomorrow. And then you just keep banking that. You keep banking. You keep grinding. And that is no different than that decision at 11 years old. 
Do you think that, like, the most important thing, you know, like, even, like, biblically, a man without vision shall perish, that the most important thing is to have a goal to aspire to, something like a Tony Robbins, like, you got to be, like, passionate, like, deep burning, like, i got to have that. Is that the most important thing, then? Because what separated, perhaps, you from I, I mean, obviously, different circumstances, mm -hmm. but just assuming yeah. it's all the same, why were you different? We had the exact same dream, we're both healthy, I mean, you're gigantic, I'm not, but I could have played baseball potentially, mm -hmm. who knows, you know. Yeah. What yeah. separates us? A, a lot of it is luck. Um, you have to have a certain amount of luck. And, um, you know, some people may say, you know, well, that's a God decision. That's God's decision. It's like, well, uh, yeah, I, I, to a degree I believe it is, but if you put yourself at a higher risk in certain situations, that's your decision, <laughs> You know, I think that, you know, I mean, I'll just refer to God as God for, to speak freely. I'm not going right, to, yeah. I don't care if somebody says higher power. I don't care if they worship a doorknob. If it keeps them sober and it makes yep. their life better, Agreed. then so be it, as long as they're not hurting people. Agreed. Um, so I think, you know, having a stimulated mind constantly, and for me, it's such a perfect, it's hard to even, well, it is a profession because it is work and you do get tired, but photography. And, I, and sometimes I want to say, it's not even photography, it's, that's just the medium I'm using. It's the creativity that's the stimulation. Because I could use, and not to, and, you know, it's funny, but not to be funny, I could get a box of 32 Crayolas, crayons. And if I wanted to get out a big sheet of paper and put it on an easel and start drawing art, if that was my thing, then I'm not the crayon guy. I still am creating an expression of what I'm creating. Hmm. So mine just so happens to be photography. My biggest motivator, really my whole life, like, like what drives you, what makes your blood scream? What's made my blood scream ever since I was a kid is music. Wow. Just, I can, even this morning. Like, what do you like now? Uh, if you had to take a guess, you'd probably know. <laughs> but it's like, like, I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, I liked a lot of uh, rock and roll, um, liked a lot of heavy metal. Yeah. was okay with alternative metal, yeah. you know, because they got a little weird. I mean, for me. Now, I mean, they're great bands, but, I mean, I love, like, classic, like, rock. Like, like I love Bob Dylan. I love Jackson Brown. I don't even know if they consider Jackson Brown rock. I don't know. But, like, um, I love Pat Benatar. Yeah. Okay, I love Blondie. Yeah. I like okay, I, I love John Cougar or John Mellencamp. Yeah. yeah. I love Iron Maiden. I love Judas Priest. I love Guns N' Roses. You gotta love Rush, being from Toronto. Oh yeah, I mean to think the music that they put out with three guys is is like, are you kidding? When I found that out when I was younger, obviously my all-time favorite band. They are just, I mean, you talk about creative. Yeah. And you talk about a cool drum set. I mean, yeah. when, you can't, when you can't see the drummer because there's <laughs> so many drums, yeah. it's like that's pretty cool. Yeah. And 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 speaking of that, I don't know if you've ever had a chance. I've never met him. I've never spoke with him. Uh, but the drummer Neil Pert, yeah, quite a story. Really? Yeah. Read his book. He he put out a book. I want to say ten or fifteen years ago, that is jaw dropping. And wow. it is it is it's tragic. Um, if I remember correctly, it wasn't so much about the drinking and the drugs. It was more like tragic events that happened with his family, like almost overnight, unexpectedly. Oh, no. um, phenomenal book. Just a, like, it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. Oh, I will. He's my yeah. favorite guy in the band. He's the guy yeah. that wrote all the songs. Yeah. He's like yeah. a creative Oh, yeah. Band. Like, I loved Rush. Uh, do you remember Triumph? Like, Triumph yeah, was a Canadian band. band. from Canada, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, Here's a, a thing that gives me hope. There's some people that give me hope that I love. Ozzy. Yeah. 
I'm like, oh, so am I. Yeah. <laughs> right? I like it more after the reality show, actually, you know? Well, right, right. And then um, Keith Richards yeah. is like, how is he still alive? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I love the Stones. Like, I, I love the Stones. And here's the funny part. I love the Stones. I could care less for the Who. But they're very similar. Yeah. It's just interesting. I think it's what you relate to. And, but, boy, I tell you what, when guns come on, Guns and Roses... I could just feel my blood just. Yeah, starting. I'm just, all about like ACDC. Yeah, and I, 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 and stuff like that. It's what I work out to. Or and they're so bluesy, like Christian music or something like that too. But yeah, yeah. Well, let me do this. I want to go. So take me on your NFL journey though, because you weren't just in the NFL. Like you were, uh, you were the first or second guy chosen in the NFL. And um, I remember that formidable uh, uh, Sports Illustrated with, the, you know, freaking each peck was like that big <laughs> type of thing. And so take, take us through that kind of journey, if you will, a little bit. Because I know there was elation and then there was some really dark, like, no kidding, when I, we talked about that, blew me yeah. away. You know, the, you know, what, I had a, a realization years ago now, and it's been um, proven to me over and over again as years have gone by, and as I've done things, set things out to accomplish, I get way more enjoyment out of the process than I do the result. Draft day for me was I don't want to say it was a letdown. Listen, it was an honor to be drafted second. That was the whole goal. That was the end game for me. Who was me. first? Who was first? Uh, Troy Aikman. Oh. So four, actually four of the first five picks are in the Hall of Fame. Wow. Barry Sanders was taken third behind me in the Hall of Fame. Derek Thomas was fourth, who's passed away in a car accident 15 years ago, Was in is in the Hall of Fame. And Deion Sanders was fifth. He's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Freaking nature, yeah. Deion Sanders. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. He glided across the field. Uh, and a great guy. Great guy. Um, but the that's a, quite a group to be surrounded with. Now, when's the last time that's happened? Never. Wow. It's never happened. Which, in a way, is kind of amusing to me because it amplifies my failure even more. <laughs> Right, yeah. because it's like, look at all this. Well, little did I know that, and and you know, my failure, if you if if you want to call it that, or my setback, or my defect, or my disease, or whatever, it's like a plot, I'm a, plot twist. Yeah, it's like what I thought was my biggest downfall, it, it became my greatest asset. Wow. In life, and and when I say I, I don't mean monetary, I mean quality of life, ability to speak with people, ability to say something. Um, you know, I'll get an email from somebody that says, I was at a meeting, and this just happened a few months ago. This was actually came, I got the email before the E60 came out. Um, a girl emailed me here in Phoenix, and she's a fitness girl, and she said, I was at my first meeting at this one meeting here in town, and you were the speaker, and it was a noon meeting, and she goes, and today I'm celebrating four years. And it's like that, yeah. that alone is worth it, Yeah. okay? And so then, of course, I write her back jokingly, say, see, I mean, I have the power to get people sober, and all this, and I start joking with her. <laughs> and then and then I say, but also you can blame me for all the times you were drunk. <laughs> I said, I don't have that power. I said, I'm so glad that, because usually, like a lot of times, not always, I don't script my talk. I just share my story. Yeah. And a lot of the times, at the, uh, at the end, most of the times, I say, you know what? Give yourself a, at least 30 days. I said, just give yourself 30 days. You know what? You may not be an addict or an alcoholic. Okay. Hmm. Chances are that if you're in this room, like I've never went to a women's bridge club meeting. Why? Because I'm not a woman and I'm not in the bridge. 
So, you know, you don't stumble into an AA meeting or a 12-step meeting of any kind because you're just checking stuff out. No. I don't want to check out the, you know, stuff that, that, I, that I think I might be. I think the acid test is if you're even wondering internally if you are something, you probably are. Well, you got that still small voice inside you that's telling you, you know, you probably ought to do this, probably ought to do this. Most of the time, I don't react on the first time. It takes me right. sometimes weeks right. doing something nagging. But, yeah, yeah I agree. But it's, uh, it, you know, and, and so when I get emails like that, it just fuels that, man, all that pain was worth it. It was worth it. So you were drafted number two to Green Bay. You're an offensive uh, tackle or guard? Um, drafted as a tackle, um, was in Green Bay as a tackle, and then, you know, got the boot out of the league for three years and then made it got sober. Did a comeback with Indy and was a tackle for my first year in Indy and a guard my uh, last two years in Indy. Okay, so... The initial triumph, tragedy, and then triumph. So I'm going to go a little bit more. So, like, you're at Green Bay, and um, you're, you know, going to do all uh, great things and stuff like that. But, you know, also, that's a very um, injury-prone, I'll probably put it that way, uh, position just being in the NFL. And back then, they passed out, like, Vicodin and Oxy or whatever they had back then, like it was candy. Like, I, uh, you know, what was this expression they'd say, like, I mean, now, like, if you get a he your helmet, not to trivialize TBI or something like that, but they pull you out and stuff right. like that. Back then, it was like, you got to be showing bone. Was, yeah. uh, you know, right. shake it off, smelling salts, yeah. or, oh, you're hurt or you're injured, take these. So right. take us a little bit through some of the take these. Um, the stereotype is that, you know, big bowl of painkillers sitting there, the trainer is not true. Oh, okay. That's just not true. Um, is it much easier to get them? Yeah, it is. And you can get, you know, at least these are just my experiences. Sure. And and I can con that game, as you know, like, as, like we can con really well. Um, so I, and how do you like, how, how do you not justify your back hurting or your shoulder hurting when you're hitting every day? Yeah. And you're playing. And so... What started out as the right motive, I was taking it for the pain. I ended up finding out, like, out of left field, you know, boy, I, I feel really good when I take this. Okay. It's like not only does it take the pain away, but it takes all the problems away, too. Yeah. And I was like, it's like a magic bullet. Yeah. And then that magic bullet um, ends up, instead of being like a you know solution ends up being the problem because of the way we're wired and the way we it's insidious uh, yeah it, and it's patient and it sneaks up on you and there's the cliches right all those little cliches and it's in the corner doing push-ups waiting it's a funny cliche it's kind of cheesy it's true mm -hmm. it's you know it's waiting um you see friends go out after 20 years um because they're not staying connected with people in sobriety or, or, or they're not surrounding themselves. You know what? There's a lot of ways to get sober. 12-step programs are not the only way. And I think any, and I know most legitimate, respectable, accredited 12-step institutions or treatment centers will tell you that. Yep. They'll say, this is one way to get sober that works for a lot of people. Yep. It's not the only way. Yep. I tried so many different ways. And finally, I tried this way, and it worked. And what, was, what way was that? It, it, was, the, it was going to the treatment mm -hmm. um, for 17 days. I went for 17 days. It was a 30-day treatment. I had no insurance. It was 1000 bucks a day. And, and, you know, in 1995, you think 1000 bucks, it's luxurious and stuff. It was outside of Detroit. <laughs> it was... It was it was good. It was clean. It was like a dorm, but it was a hospital only for treatment. Uh, Brighton Hospital, and and you know I'll, I'll forever be grateful for Brighton Hospital, and uh, and it was simple, and I saw some things in there that I never want to see again a human go through, 
um, just what opiates do to people and when they're detoxing and withdrawing and you know medication can only do so much to take you down like they put me on phenobarbital uh, for the for the safety factor of seizures um, because phenobarbital does kind of like it is I, I think it is a little bit of a like a downer like a it'll chill you a little but you know they're giving you such a small dose, and the they're like, and you're when you're taking 80, 90 painkillers a day, you're not feeling one pill of phenobarbital, and they're doing it for safety, and they're controlling it all. And or, I don't want to gloss over 80 or 90 pills. In the last three months, it was wow. a, a a day, coupled with um, alcohol. Golly, man. Well, I guess knowing you're you know big as Goliath, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it'll break you. It'll 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 bring you to your knees in in a way that uh, uh, it it broke me, and I got so sick and tired of me, so sick and tired of me, and pointing the finger at everybody. And but it was you know the the draft you know going back to that original question about you know draft day, um, Green Bay flew me into Green Bay. We did the draft. And my brother was there, and you know my brother was, you know, my idol, five years older than me, um, and it was like we were standing in the stands, and it was you know stands are empty, and I was like, God, can you believe that this is only ten years later from the decision? Because you're twenty one years old. Wow, wow, ten years, that's fast. Yeah, and you're, and you're, you know, and it was surreal. And a letdown at the same time. Wow, interesting. And when I say letdown, it didn't it didn't matter if it was Green Bay or San Diego or it wouldn't have mattered what team it was. I was kinda like, This is it. Like this is Mecca. Like this is what I've been working for. And you know, obviously, and then it got better because game days. You know, you love football, and Lambo is about as much tradition as you'll get. And it's a, I mean, it's a phenomenal, magical place. Um, but it was a letdown. That draft day was a huge day in someone's life, and it was a letdown internally. And I don't share that too much um, because I don't want it to be taken the wrong way. Um, has nothing to do with the Packers. It's, it's all. It's all of what I internalized. Um, I expected, I don't know if I expected more or something different. And then as years went by, and I had great failures, then some successes, then some failures, then some great successes and failures, and just like everybody in life, whether you're sober or not, and whether you're an alcoholic or not, you start to realize or I started to realize, for me personally, I way more enjoyed the process of getting to the goal than the actual goal itself. I liked the grind. And so today, and, and I'll put it in today's analogy, when I do a photo shoot, it's like, I mean, I don't advertise too much like corporate headshots at all. I do all that stuff. And I do... You know, real estate stuff, architecture stuff, it's in all these things, I don't advertise for it. What I advertise for is somebody that wants something that has a certain style and feel. Because there's a lot of great photographers out there. A lot of them. And, you know, digital cameras have become much more affordable and good quality. So now you have all these creatives that couldn't afford a camera before and creating stuff that's just incredible yeah. and and it's like you know it, how do you how do you compete with creativity it's like what what am i what makes okay what makes you the best football player well you're an all pro what makes you the best football player one of the best football players in college you're an all american you know there's benchmarks there's there's yeah. um, things what makes you the best photographer? Well, what are you basing it on? Revenue? Are you basing it on if you have a display in a museum? Are you basing it on what are you basing it on? So it's really 
like, I don't want to say I'm in competition with myself, but it's like, I want to be the most robust, creative, um, the, 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 the most robust, creative, creative that I can be. I like and, that. Yeah, and it's like, it just happens to be that... Um, Is that how you approach everything, by the way? I, I always wonder, you know, in the mindset of um, uh, just the tiny, tiny percentage of every little kid's dream, or not every, but let's just say every, you know, little boy's dream, you know, I'm going to be in the NFL, and then the teeny, tiny, tiniest, even out of all of the college players, like, just to get into like a Division One college is crazy odds against you. But then even out of the college players, like it's tiny, tiny, tiny uh, to get in there. And so I wonder about like what makes guys like you tick. And then I think to myself like I bet you you expressed yourself like in football. But my assumption is you probably carry that into everything that you do. Am I right about that? You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, when you have a headache, do you take Tylenol or do you take extra strength Tylenol? I take extra strength. Why? <laughs> because it's better, man. It's the best. Makes sense to me. Right. <laughs> why, would, why would I want to? I'll just, I'll just take regular Tylenol so the headache goes away over two hours instead of one hour or 20 minutes. That's like one analogy that I would use. It's like you do like I don't wake up and consciously say today's gonna be a great and I don't know if you can say fucking, but today's gonna be a great you say it. Today's gonna be a great fucking day and I'm gonna do something I've never done in my life before today. What that is, I have no idea. But I'm gonna do something great today. And how many times have you woken up and said, I'm going to make it a fucking average day? Never. Never. I never have. No. Okay. Now, we don't, I, I don't consciously think those things on a daily basis. Yep. It's just default. It's wired. Yeah. It's default. I like that. And it's like, status quo is not for me. That, like, the, the median is not for me. I want to be above the median, not to be better than, just to set my goal, to, to, to push myself, to be a better human being, whatever that is. I'm so lucky. I can't tell you how lucky I am to have been able to do football, do what I do now, photography and art, you know, art that creative world, and then now share the story and public speak and go to summits and conferences and corporations. I'll go to corporations that don't want me, like they'll say, yeah, you can talk about your story and alcohol and stuff, but the main keys we want to hit on are how did you deal with adversity? Hmm. How did you deal with no, I don't want the contract. No, I don't want the contract. No, because after a while, a sales guy gets beat up by no, but every no is a closer to a yes. Yeah. Jeffrey Tom will tell you that. Right. <laughs> so it's a matter of not taking it personally in that sense. So I'm now doing like, uh, I just mentioned three things, and there's a lot of things in between. That, But those are like three major things for me that I've done that I absolutely love and have a passion for. And what's my barometer for how do I know that that's my passion? I lose track of time. Wow. I lose track of time. I'm like, it's 7 o'clock already? And we started this at like noon. I thought it was like 2 o'clock. That's my barometer. That's why I'm like, yeah. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, yeah, I've got a business to run. And that's important because you got to, you know, pay the mortgage, you got to put food on the table, you got to do this, and you know, there's bills, everybody's got bills. Just because you played in the NFL doesn't mean you don't have bills. Yep. So, it's like, but this to me is extremely important. And, and there's that one cliche, you know, there's that cliche that is, for me it's kind of getting old to say it, 
but it's true. It's like, it, look, if our dialogue today helps one person get, like, just one person get sober or at least try to get sober, it was worth it. All the pain that I went through, all the pain that you went through was worth it. And that has become a little cliche to me, but it's true. It really is freaking true. Yeah. Because when the E60 thing came out on uh, Easter Sunday morning for the first time, and then it aired three more times that day. Yeah. This I didn't put ESPN, anything else. This is the ESPN uh, documentary yeah. on you. Yeah. Is the E60 on it just titled by my last name. And the producer of that piece, uh, we'll Simon, put it in this article somewhere. I'll embed it. In, yeah, in this, as he well. did a phenomenal job telling the story. It took a, it, it was done over a twelve month period. Wow. Yeah, it was it was it was intense. It was awesome, and Jeremy Schaap was awesome. And uh, Jeremy Schaap said that was the longest sit down interview that he had ever done in his life. He said, be, wow. and he it was seven hours of sitting. In a chair, like we took, you know, breaks here and there, but seven hours of the, the sit down part of the interview, and they probably only end up using ten minutes out of sixty yeah. minutes of that sit down. But he's, uh, and I said, really? I, I said, I'm like, you've interviewed like, like superstars, not like riffraff like me, right? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, he's like, well, you're not. He goes, you're not riffraff, obviously. And I'm like, I know that. I'm just messing with you. I said, but. He goes, the one thing about you is you're not afraid to talk about anything and you're very transparent and you won't throw people under the bus. And to me, that loyalty is the same kind of loyalty that you can, that I can only describe. It must feel like that to be a Navy SEAL or in the military. The esprit de corps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The just that brotherhood type of yeah. thing. Like, yeah. You got your back. Got you bleed it. together. You sweat together. You train together. You fight each other. You fight. But you know what? You can't buy that. Yeah. You, and it's hard. You know. So it's, take take us through a little bit of the of the um, uh, you know how you made the decision. Like, because you were in the NFL for one year. And then derailed pills, everything like that. Thanks for putting it lightly. <laughs> I love you for it. <laughs> so it didn't work out as planned. Didn't work no, out. You did literally put it lightly. It was a train wreck. <laughs> and so then you're out, right? And then, God, now that is, I think it's cool because when you talk about, like, the deal, how do you deal with diversity, like, you then had to remake a decision, of course, the 10-year-old right. decision. Right. But then, like, the odds are stacked against you because it wasn't like it was the next season that you came back, or was it? No, three years later. Three years? Three years. Like, three years that's, like, freaking impossible. Out of the, yeah, it was three years out of the league. So it was the fourth season I came back. Impossible. So how how overall, take us a little bit through that, and then obviously you played for, what, six more years? Is that what it was? Um, no, played for three more with Indy. Okay. And then got and then retired because of a shoulder. Okay. All right. So how how did you kind of pick yourself back up, dust yourself off, so to speak, oh. and start all over again? I will not use the phrase, it can't get worse, because it did. Wow. When I got the boot out of Green Bay, I was like, wow, four years ago, I had the world in the palm of my hand. I was on the cover of the magazine. Um, I was the first million-dollar offensive lineman ever. Wow. Without playing it down in the league, but ever. Any any offensive lineman in the league that was all Anthony Munoz. I mean, we're talking guys that are like. Legendary. Legendary. Yeah. Have not made a million dollars a year that deserve to make a million dollars a year. So I feel good about that in the way because the next year, because, you know, Contracts are up for other people. The next year, there was like 27 offensive linemen that made over a million dollars a year. You broke the four-minute mile. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I, in, internally, I feel very proud of that. And it's not because of the monetary. Like for me, it's not my monetary that I feel proud of. It's a, they deserve that. Right. And they deserved it before I got paid. Because the shoulders of that league were built on theirs. 
yeah. and the guys before them. And, you know, that's a whole other subject. I mean, that, yeah. and those guys are not being taken care of. Yeah. And that's the tra- I mean, that's a tragedy. What do you think, by the way, just so I don't lose it, what do you think, by the way, about the extraordinary um, amounts of money? I live in, I live in Seattle, so I, I love the Seahawks, and I think Russell Wilson is just, you know, an amazing human being. $35 million a year, not only the extraordinary amount of money, but then also the major discrepancy. But I look at it like you got to have a quarterback. What do you? What are your thoughts on that? Like, I look at what's your value. Like, what value do you bring to the table? Yeah, he brings a lot more than like. Okay, look at the end of the day. Let's not kid ourselves. You got to be able to play the game. Yeah. Okay, you got to be able to play the game. But boy, it sure doesn't hurt when you're an outspoken, great community leader. Yeah, he's a, he's with Children's Hospital every week. Right. He's a great so, person. Who doesn't want that? How much value does it? How much money does that make him? Yeah. And you know what? He didn't even probably the way he is. And I've never met him. The only thing I hold against him is that he beat Michigan State in the Big Ten championship one year. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I hold against him. I was like in the like with less than a minute left. But great quarterback, great guy, great human being. Yeah. It's like how. M- he didn't go to sick children's or he didn't go to charities or he didn't go to these things and be like, well, this is going to add value to me. My brand. Yeah, yeah, so I can brand myself and make more money on my renegotiation. No, he did it because that's how he's wired and that's what right. his heart tells him to do. Yeah. And that you can't put a price tag on. And fans don't look at it that way and I don't expect them to look at it that way. Fans yeah. look at, I'm spending too much money to buy a ticket. Yeah. You know, well, you're not forced to. You don't have to go to the game. And and then when they do, they feel that they have the right to call you and your family whatever names they want. And it's like, well, so does anybody on the street. And then you realize, you know, I'm not going to lower myself to that level of trash. And the guy's probably drinking because most people that are trash talking from the stands are not um, – Clear eyed, if you will. (laughs) But that being said, you know, I respect the heck out of the fact that they love their team. They love their team. And, um, you know, what they did in Seattle, man, when when I played in the league and we played against Seattle, it was like a joke. I mean, they were not good at the Kingdom. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you remember people like Jim Zorn. Right? And and I think he went into politics and did well. I think. Yeah, I think so. And and then um, I don't know if you remember uh, S- Sam Adams, ninety number ninety eight. He was a defensive lineman. I think he played at University of Miami. Big, huge dude. And uh, like I played against him before. He was all American, all everything in college. Drafted high. He was one of their D linemen, and it's like there were some players that they had that were good. Steve Largent, you know. Yeah, guys like, but for the most part, it's like Seattle was at the Kingdom when, when I played. That tells you how old I am. Yeah. And it was like, eh, you know, it's Seattle. It's just Seattle. And then when new ownership came in, and everything starts from the top, and that ownership came from a another company that had some decent success. Microsoft, um, yeah. you know they did okay, yeah. uh, and and they they probably got out a piece of paper <laughs> or however their methodology is, or it wouldn't surprise me if he can do it all in his head and say we need these people in, in these places to manage this 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 and this. And we need to build this, and we need to spend X amount of millions on branding this thing, not just for the team, but we need to put this city on the map. Yeah. And then, and and they, and they from what I see, that's what they did. And, you know, it's like I'm not a huge Seahawks fan, but I'm definitely not a not fan. I mean, I like it. I like it. If, if Seattle's on, I'll watch them. Who do, who do you like now? Is it Green Bay or is it Indy or who do you like? Green Bay and Indy. Um, Green Bay and Indy, yeah. I mean, I, I really – enjoy watching them but I mean I still have a huge passion for the NFL um, you know I support the Cardinals 
I mean, I, I watched oh, the Arizona sure. Cardinals, and, yeah, and yeah. you know, I, I mean, a perfect example when we're talking about people like Russell Wilson is Kurt Warner. Yeah, great human being. The stuff he does here in the Valley, here in, that people don't know about, and he doesn't want the media there, and it's like that alone screams volumes of what kind of a person he is. Yeah. His story and, is quite remarkable. His personal, it, his oh, and other, it's, like, it's incredible. Thirty thirty, it's pretty remarkable. It's incredible. So I derailed my question though. So you're, how do you? So how did? What did you do? So it's just going through hell, and then you got it. Who gave you a shot back? How did you even get like? Because most of you, I'm sure you were told, it's over, it's over, it's over. Forget about it. How? Who finally? How did you get a oh, shot? And I want it. And I'll take the three years and condense it into sixty seconds. I wanted it to be over. Because it was everybody's fault. It was Green Bay's fault, media's oh, wow. fault, mom and dad's fault, my brother's fault, my wife's fault, my kids' fault. It was everybody's fault but mine, except that was the common denominator in all the right. problems. Um, can't get worse. Uh, two months later, after they give me the boot, my brother dies of cancer, 31 years old. Um, nine months later, my parents get divorced after 42 years of marriage after all the stuff they went through escaping from a communist country. Wow. Which is an incredible story, but it's a more common story than, pe than people know. There's a lot of immigrants that escaped from communist countries to come here for a better life for themselves and their family. So it's a remark still a remarkable story, but there's a lot of people that have done it, a lot of, you know, Italian, I mean, just all from all the different countries. You know, my parents were from Croatia, former part of former Yugoslavia. So, you know, it's, that was like, what do you mean? Like, the brother dying was like, we knew he had terminal cancer and he died and it was, I was so messed up. It was, I was numb, but still, it's a shocker, right? It's like your brother, your sibling is gone. Then... It's like, what do you mean you're getting divorced? It's like your mom and dad. Like your mom and dad that lived there in that house at home. Forever. Forever. Like, it's like that's how it's been. What do you mean you're getting divorced? And I'm still at this point all messed up, like on the chemicals. And so, it, it, and then what do I do? I medicate more to numb the pain. And then, you know, comes a day, March 23rd, 1995, and it was, it was not a bright light. I wish I could tell you it was a meteor shooting out of the sky that ended up exploding saying, get sober, Tony. <laughs> it wasn't, it was like a realization that a good friend of mine said, if you don't change what you're doing, you're going to, uh, and it, if you don't change what you're doing, you're going to die and you're going to be sitting on this couch because we were having a talk at my house. He goes, you're going to be sitting on this couch three years from now, just like you have been the last three years. And I was like, what? And he said, he said, what? And I said, what do you mean I've been here three years? He goes, I said, I've been out of the league for three years. And it, I thought it was like six months. Wow. And he's like, yeah, you've been out of the league for three years. And it was like a baseball bat coming across my head. And that was kind of like the catalyst talk. And I said, give me the, um, the night to sleep on it to make a decision. And, but internally, I already kind of knew. I was at 51%. Yes, I'm going to change. It was just a matter of logistics. How do I, what do I do? I don't know what to do. So you got sober in order to get back to the league? Was that the catalyst then? Oh. No. I had no uh, no intention of going back to the league and being ridiculed again. Um, my reason for getting sober because I was sick and tired of me mm. and and my miserable life and me feeling sorry for myself and all these self loathing things. It just it built up to a point where I never hey I never contemplated suicide because I was too damn selfish. Mm. I was like, the world's going to miss out on my great ideas, right? It's like, that's how important I thought I was. So the miracle, ha like, and, and, and I tried many ways to get sober. I'm talking hundreds of ways to get sober. Little games you play, tricks you play in your head, this. And then one time, I went 14 days in a row without drinking or drugging. 
And that little voice, that little voice inside my head was like, see, you don't have alcoholism. You're not an addict. You just went 14 days. So I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I can have a couple pills. And, you know, a month later, you're off and running at 50, 60 again. Wow. And, um, and then it came that day and, and, uh, my buddy called down and said they will, they would have a bed for me, a space for me in two days. And they did. Um, and I drove down and I, I remember like it was yesterday and it's been 24 years now. And I put my hand on the door. I can see this like it's burned in my memory. I put my hand on the door and I said to myself, the fun is over. And little did I know it was just about to begin. Yeah. The best years of my life were ahead of me. And I was like, the fun is over. But I'd rather be glum and boring and sober than miserable and drunk. You know, I think that life's more exciting, actually. I mean, when you're fully aware type of thing. I, I don't, Absolutely. I don't find, you know, at all that people think, you know, people might, if they're still drinking, they, I think they think, yeah, I'm going to be boring or something like that. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, I go, you know, if you have to actually take some kind of substance in order to feel okay, right. that's a problem. Like, you know, my wife, she'll drink a glass of wine here and there. We've got a couple bottles of wine in the house. Right. You know, but rarely will she drink. Right. Uh, we go out to dinner, she'll have a glass or two or something like that, maybe. Right. Uh, but it's more like a choice, like I choose to type of thing, right. rather than like I need to in order to feel okay. And it's not... Also, you know, I've talked to other people, too, that they maybe even drank occasionally, but then they would freaking drink to black out. They'd black, you know, they right. so extreme. Once they did it, it was right. like, you know... They binged. So, I mean, you know, again, if somebody's watching or you're thinking, like you said, you go to an AA meeting or something like that, it's probably a pretty good indicator, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good chance that you are. <laughs> so so you make it back into Indy. You get a shot. You play for three years, which is it's not a fluke. It's not like somebody just signed you up. Plus, you don't really have flukes in the NFL, right? Like, I mean, they cut your ass if you're – it's performance-based. Right. right. Like, you could – you know, I, I mean, to get an opportunity was a miracle because I was thorough on burning all my bridges when I left. To get even an opportunity to Who get a work an opportunity. Um, the first team that gave me the opportunity was Philly. Did and anybody, go, anybody in particular go to bat for you? Um, well, my agent, mm -hmm. um, but it was really more my agent was more just networked. You still got to perform. Yeah. So, so you know, here we are, and uh, it was like January of '96. I'm like, and how 10 long months, have you been sober? A year, ten, or two? ten months at this time. Wow. So and, they're all about like, look, man, are you doing drugs still? Well, like, they're like, yeah. they're like, where, where have you been? Like, what happened? And like, oh. like, who's this guy? This is the guy we saw in college. Wow. Right. The size and the big because I was working out. I was sleeping. I was doing all the right things. Like my schedule was meetings, sleeping, uh, eating right, working out. Oh wow! And basically, at the end of the day, I would ask myself that I'd leave anything on the plate, metaphorically, wow. and sometimes literally. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, did I leave any? Did I leave anything in the gas tank? Because if I did, so they're I like, "Oh my God, you're back. Where have you been?" That's crazy. And here's the here's the funniest thing. So that was January of. 96 and I got drafted in 89 so it was seven years later you could say I was on the top of the world seven years prior calling my own shots Philadelphia said we'll give you a workout to see if we even you know consider signing you they said we have a scout flying in from California who has a six-hour layover in Cleveland so meet at this community college, this Christ, Christian community college um, in Cleveland, in the suburbs of Cleveland. It was beautiful. Like just, it was, even though it was winter, it was beautiful. And, and work out in this basketball gymnasium and use their weights for the weight lifting test. And like they didn't time my 40 because there just was no, like you couldn't run. But they timed my 20 and then they timed my um, shuttle drills and my and my movement and my strength and all this 
and the scout go and so like they're like that's as much time as they'll give me and I had to drive down to Cleveland on my own dime and I had to pay for my own hotel and I was grateful for doing it yeah I felt like the luckiest guy on the planet after all the nonsense I had done someone still is going to give me a chance and and I kept saying to myself getting sober was impossible and it happened the miracle happened so now really for me anything is possible it really is so football although I knew it was so what easy. happened with that though you didn't get taken by Philly so how did you end so up Philly so I I have the workout with Philly the scout is a you know never met the guy great guy the head coach was Ray Rhodes who was an assistant coach at Green Bay when they let me go oh, okay so I knew Ray Rhodes, but he was he's the head coach. He, it was just a scout. He was flying through. He had a layover, and they said, if you can get to Cleveland on tomorrow on this day and meet at this college, at, like look for the scout by the uh, athletic facility, and he'll work you out, and then uh, he'll report back to Ray Rhodes. So I have a great workout. And the guy goes, he's sitting there staring at me like, He's like, he's like, is this a joke? Like, where have you been? Like, where have you been? And like, the, like this, like, where was this talent in Green Bay? And I just, and I was honest with him. I was transparent. I said I had a really bad drug problem and an alcohol problem. And, um, but I take, you know, full responsibility for all of my actions. I, I'm not going to use that as a crutch, but that was the problem. And I said, I got, I got sober 10 months ago, and I had no intention of coming back to play, but I thought, how do I try to make things right? Because some things you can make right, some things you just can't. What a cool thing. And I thought, how do I make things as right as possible? And I was like, if someone gives me a chance, that's all I need. And if I do get that chance, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to do my work. And I'm going to earn my money instead of stealing it. And so Philly's like, like within two hours, I'm already driving back. It's an eight-hour drive back to Traverse City, Michigan, where I was living. I get a phone call or like a phone call from my wife at the time because they had called the house saying, um, he had checked in with Ray Rhodes, and, and Ray Rhodes said that they want to fly me out um, in about three or four days for another workout so Ray Rhodes can see. And I'm like, holy smokes. Like, I'm like, I'm like amazed, but I'm not because of the miracle of sobriety already happened. Awesome. And that was like the most impossible thing to happen. And it happened. And not only did it happen, but I was happy sober. So, so then I knew, I was like, it, it, it doesn't mean that it was easy to come back, but I knew it was possible and it was necessary. It was, it was crucial in my recovery for a couple of reasons, to slay the demons, to prove I can play without a drug in my body, whether it's performance enhancing or painkiller or anything, and for days like today. So how did you end up, though, at Indy, though? So Philly said well, no. So the network, the community is small, uh -huh. right? Thirty. Well, at that time, there wasn't even 32 teams. I think it was 28. Yeah. Uh, word got out somehow. That same day or that same night, I got home at like 9 p.m. at night. Indianapolis calls and says, we want to fly you out on the first flight tomorrow morning to Indianapolis for a workout. And I just drove like, 16, 16 <laughs> hours, and, I, and I'm thinking, well, hey, now I've earned a flight. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. I said, um, he's like, I'll call you back with the details and, and arrangements, but he's like, you're available and willing. And I said, absolutely. I said, I appreciate. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Went down there, had a great workout. Sat down with um, the GM head coach, the coordinators, the old line coach, all the trainers, the doctors, and was talking to them like I'm talking to you, but it was a lot like, way shorter and basically like, look, this is what happened. 
you're in, you know, got sober. It's a miracle. I was a train wreck. I'm not using an excuse. I did use steroids in college like everybody thought. Um, I didn't use them in the pros because the testing was too hard. I said, and then I replaced the steroids with the chemicals of drugs and alcohol, opiates and alcohol when I got to Green Bay. I said, three years went by. It got worse. I got sober 10 months ago. You're getting damaged goods is what I said. But I'm being transparent, just so you know what you're getting yourself into, if you even choose to sign me. And they said, okay, well, let's, you know, go change into your grays and let's work you out. And they were like, they were all like dumbfounded with the transparency, right? Because <laughs> in the NFL, it ain't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so unless you're like a Russell Wilson, right? Or somebody that's like, hey, what you see is what you get. And, but I had created such a bad stigma of my own doing. And, uh, and why should they believe me? So I have even a better workout with Indy, like 24 hours after the Philly workout. And so, and, the, and now I have a flight that leaves at 4 p.m. I work out at like 1, and the workout was less than an hour. And, uh, they were like, oh, we can't believe, like, this is the guy that we saw in the draft, like, physically and attitude-wise, like, focused and, and clear. And, and I said, and clear-eyed. And because even when I had done steroids, you're still, you're not like, it's different. It's different. I'm not saying you do it. I'm just saying it's, it's a different kind of drug. Yeah. And, but they were like... And I, but I told them, I said, look, I said, I'm not, I don't want to criticize myself and I'm not downplaying anything. I'm just being transparent and I don't want you to hear it from anybody else six months from now. I go to meetings. I go to a 12 step program. I said, that's how I maintain my sobriety. That's what gives me the tools to live my life on a daily basis, which are just tools that if you took the word alcohol or, or drugs out of the sentences, they're just a good guide for living. How many self-help books do we have of eight steps to better business yeah. practices? It's yeah. the same thing, except your life depends on it. Yeah. Right? Your survival depends on it. So I, I, I did tell them, I said, you're getting damaged goods. And I thought to myself, even, I'm going to say that because even if it hurts me financially, I don't care. Because I felt like I stole for four years in Green Bay by not giving them everything I had. Like, on the field, mentally, everything. And they came back. As, as I just got done showering, and they came. The, the scout came back into the locker room with um, a contract. And, and it was like, you know, it, it was like February. Nobody's there, right? Like, all the players are gone till like, April, till the draft, and then mini camps. And they go, we want to sign you to a two-year deal. First year... Uh, minimum wage for a fourth year player, which is, was 196000 and second year, 500000 And it was like, you've seen the movie Matrix. And like when they're flying through the air and everything's just like slow motion. Right, like, right. The whole, everything became right. slow. Right? I was like, what did you say? <laughs> and, and the first thought that came into my mind was this is a direct result of God and Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. And being, so that was the first thing that came to mind. I said, that is the, like, that is the key, the catalyst. I don't care what you call it, the foundation. It's like, without that, and it could have been, somebody could say it was my higher power. I don't care. It's like I'm saying the same thing. I'm referring to the same thing. For me, it's God of my understanding, which is, I think, of a lot of people's understanding. And and then for me, it was AA. It just happened to be AA because I didn't care if people knew. I didn't go around telling people, but, you know, they knew, and they needed to know, and they needed to hear it from the horse's mouth. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, 11 months ago, I couldn't get off the couch because I was so messed up. And I thought, and here I am 11 months later, 
being offered. Like somebody's saying, we want you to work for us. Wow. I was unemployable. I couldn't have worked at a 7-Eleven, a gas station. I couldn't have been a ditch digger. I don't care. And those jobs are not bad jobs. I'm just saying I couldn't have done any job because I wouldn't have been responsible enough to show up on a consistent basis. And here I was being offered a contract to go back and play the game. And I thought to myself, ah, what an opportunity this is. To carry the message, so don't fuck it up, <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's like just because you sign doesn't mean you make the team, right? You know, you still got to go through camp. You got to make the team. People, now you're back to the grind. You're grinding every day. You're grinding. And and I grinded as hard as I could for the eleven months that got me there. And I can tell you, I left nothing on the table every day. I played racquetball. Now here's your obsessive lack of balance. I played racquetball seven days a week for 90 days to get some foot speed back, even though I was only 28 years old, because when you're out of the league, yeah. you got to, and I, you know, and I had gotten a lot of foot speed back and it was still not even close to par of what I had. So, and, and I pushed as hard as I could. There were times I couldn't get off the couch when I was sober because I was so freaking tired from working out all and doing all these things. And I didn't think I could push harder. And there's a guy named Tom Zapanzik who everybody called him Zoop. He, he was a strength coach there. He was one of the top 10 strongest guys in the world in those like strongman competitions. Great, one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. And he was one of three people in the world, in my world, that could push me harder than I could push myself. And, and you know, I was like, I was like doing things that I was like, no, it's like, dude, that's like, that's not possible. Like, that's, that's a pipe dream. And he's like, no, you can do it. He's like, you can do this. And, and he, and, you know, he was the type of guy that I could talk to him about my sobriety and talk, like I was honest with him. He wasn't at that initial meeting, but he was that type of guy that you'd fight for, you would die yeah. for. Yeah. And he would do it for you. He was like a, 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 or like a warrior, if you want to say. He was a lifter. He wasn't there to get the lift in because it was mandatory. He was a lifter yeah. and a grinder. And, uh, and, and 30 days after, camps like mini camps started the draft was there everybody was back working out and then you work out and then you have this quote unquote this voluntary eight week camp that's like basically says you better you better be here or <laughs> the voluntary camp but 30 days into it we're standing there one day and in the weight room after a leg workout and I can barely stand cuz my legs are spaghetti and he looks at me, and we've got, like, chalk all over our hands, and we're, like, as old school as it gets. And he goes, can you fucking believe in 30 days you walked in here and you took this place over? And wow. I, I was like, wow. So, and he was one of those guys that I was like, hey, this guy I hold in high, high esteem. So when he, for him... To say that, like I was like blown away because I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't think about stuff like that. I just think about keep grinding, rinse and repeat, keep grinding, but rinse and repeat well. Don't rinse and repeat mistakes. No. And um, and that even added more fuel to the. He knew how to motivate people, or and and you know, motivation is short lived. It kind of, you hear a great song, you're motivated, and you want to go do something, and then 20 minutes later, you're, you know, you're waiting for somebody, and then you're like, ah, shit, I'm tired. Of it. Let's just yeah. screw it. Let's not go to that movie. Let's just watch something on Netflix. Okay, yeah. that's motivation. Okay, yeah. this is discipline. So tell me, fast forward all the way then to what you're doing now, to your photography studio and. You know, let's kind of do some uh, plugs and stuff like that, too. Well, I'm opening up a Red Bull, so you don't think it's no a bud. Problemo. 
it's not a Schlitz malt liquor. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, red, white, blue. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I thought to myself, uh, when I retired in 98 from shoulder injury, I stayed in Indy um, and pretty much forced myself to take 90 days off. Uh, because, and it was hard to do that because I'm always go, I'm wasting time. What am I, I'm wasting time here. And I'm like, no, I need time to digest. But the transition was smooth from the NFL because of the foundation of people I had around me. It wasn't like the transition of falling off the cliff in Green Bay. Mm -hmm. And so... I thought, well, what am I going to do? And that was right in 1999 when the dot-com era was huge. And I was like, well, I do like trading my own stock. And the Internet was just starting to do, like, you know, E-Trade and all this stuff. So I would play with some of that. And I really enjoyed it. So I was like, well, maybe I'll become a financial advisor. Uh, I'm not a rocket scientist, but, I mean, I'm, if, if you study at something and apply yourself, I believe you can do just about anything. Yeah. I mean, there, there are, you know, maybe some things, like I can't understand some quantum physics, like 99% of it, <laughs> I accept it, but it was like, I did the Series 7 test for Morgan Stanley, I felt fortunate, uh, Morgan Stanley was the biggest tenant at the World Trade Center, they had 22 floors, so I spent eight weeks in New York uh, training there. Um, uh, and worked for them for eight, between 18 months and two years and realized that I was going to work and I wasn't miserable, but I wasn't excited to go to work. Yep. And that was the barometer again. It was like, okay, you know, you don't hate it. If you hated it, I would have quit right away. I would have given my two weeks. But I just wasn't excited to go. And... Uh, and then I moved back to Canada, um, became 50% owner of a family-owned golf course business, and we ended up buying another golf course, shutting it down for a year, an old rundown course. We remodeled the whole thing, and so on that course, I did everything from ditch digging with a shovel to running bulldozers to running rock trucks to setting up POS systems on the computer. We built a new clubhouse, and then basically being general manager and owner operator so i had my chef i had my superintendent for outside and i had my pro for the pro shop and i overlooked everything and solved all the pro like you know if there was a problem that they couldn't solve or a problem with a a client a, a golfer or something you know i would get involved so, you know you have 55 we average fifty five thousand rounds a year for four said and i was there for four years so I don't obviously interact with 55,000 people a year, but out of those, say, let's just say 10 to 15,000, I would interact with. And it would be everybody from that's livid about the pace of play or livid that the greens are too slow or, or too fast. Or it's like you can't please everybody, right? And it's like that. I was like, if you can please everybody in business, you don't have enough clients. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I had good people skills before that. Four years of that really refined my people skills and taught me how to diffuse situations, how to massage things, how to, you know, be interactive, um, let people know that they matter and and have and not talk about football at all. Just talk about how was your round, how is this? What, is there anything we can, what can we do as an organization to make it better, to make the course better for you guys, the players, you know? And so, but, you know, I don't want to say the problem was, but the problem was I only grew up 20 miles from where the golf course was, so I was like that hometown hero kind of thing. So everybody knew who I was. So they always wanted to talk football, and I was like, you know what? So be it. I don't care. It, it was part of my life. And if that's what they want to hear, they want to hear the stories, and they don't know this, but they want to hear the stories that you don't read in the paper. Yeah. So what was it really like with Peyton Manning in the locker room? Right. Look, Peyton was a freaking great guy. The day Peyton walked into the locker room, he was a freaking pro. Like he was, I don't care if his dad groomed him, 
to be, he still had to do the work. He still had to walk the walk and he still had to take criticisms and compliments and all that. So, and then I, you know, would look and then I would even say stories like, you know, after Peyton being there for a month, I would like, Peyton probably doesn't even know this. I would look at him and be like, why couldn't I have been that way, acted that way, like a, like a professional instead of being, you know, uh, a distraction, you know? So, so that was great people skill building. And then from there, there were some things that happened that were promised that didn't end up manu happening. And so I was like, my, you know, no fault to anybody, but I'm going to walk away from this situation um, because it's not how it was explained to me. And so I sat there with a pad of paper at the kitchen table. And I was 38 years old and I, or 37 years old. And I said, if I could do any, this is in Canada. And I'm like, if I could do anything anywhere, what would I do? And I was like, every time I go to the Southwest, Arizona especially, my body feels literally five times better because oh, of wow. the dry, the dryness and the lack of humidity with inflammation in your joints. So that's one of the reasons. And then this, and then what would I do as a profession? And I was like photography. And, and then I'm kind of like, oh man, like, Photography is one thing, but the business of photography is a whole other animal. And it's like, you know, like, like I loved golfing until I got into the golf business. Yeah. And it became a job, kind of. Although I still like golf, I don't, I don't hate golf, but I don't love it as much as I did before I got into that business. The, I was like, so I would go to Arizona and I would start a photography business. And I left. I'm big on being true to yourself. And uh, even though sometimes it doesn't make sense, at the end of the day, I can look at myself and be okay. Um, I walked away from multiple six-figure salary and made $38,000 my first year. Wow. And, and had to pay for gas and had to buy a vehicle because it was a company vehicle back, company gas card, company insurance, company house, company everything. So it was like you had it, like people would be like, yeah, you had it made. It's like, well, you could have done it so many different ways. And, and it's like, yeah, I could have done it a lot of different ways, but it is the way I wanted to. Regrets? No. As far as that goes, yeah, absolutely not. I, I you know, business has gotten uh, to be very. It, the business has gotten good, really good. Um, business is not. The photography is, by the way, is fantastic. Oh, you know, thank before, you. When we were looking, uh, when I was looking to do this, I mean, immediately, immediately like I said. Same age, I was in college. I remember that Sports Illustrated thing going, God, that guy's a freaking beast. And um, so I remembered all that, but then obviously to catch up to you, then I discovered I didn't know anything about photography, and I looked over, went to the website, looked over some of your stuff, and I was like, you know, it's insane skills, which kind of leads me all the way back to, like, you know, I think that kind of mindset for a peak performer, unless you just implode and still stay imploded, um, by something else that just naturally, it's like, you know, it's like my daughter had said one time about getting A's, why why wouldn't you want to do that? Like, isn't that just, that's what you do, isn't it? Like, you always do your best? <laughs> I mean, she took the words right out of my mouth. It's like, doesn't everybody do that? Doesn't yeah, everybody yeah, think that way? A foreign, foreign concept, you know? <laughs> like, why would you not like, want to get A's? Yeah. Like, of course that's yeah. what you do. Or if you're going to do something, like, don't you want to do it the best of your ability? Yeah. But your stuff was great, man. I mean, it was really, really great. So obviously, anybody that's in Phoenix or close by or whatever, you want to get connected, and we'll have yeah. information in here. I'll put you. We'll put your website, yep. you know, as well. It's, but, it's and it's a direct. Like when you see them, the pictures are very dramatic. Um, most of them are very dramatic pictures, and the, 
I can tell you, each picture has a story behind it um, that's part of my life. And uh, it, it's definitely an expression of a time in my life um, woven into a theme of something else. Like maybe, like I'm in the, almost on the, I'm almost done with a self-assignment project that I'm doing called Seven Deadly Sins, Seven Cardinal Virtues. But I, my biggest thing was a lot of people have done that. A lot of photographers have done that. But I don't want to do it like everybody's done it. Everybody's done gluttony with food. Everybody's done lust with like lingerie or half naked or naked. It's like I want to do, which makes it harder. Because how now do you how do you do lust with a turtleneck? <laughs> if you will, right? So, and it doesn't have to be a woman. Okay, so um, lust is still on the table, still trying to figure it out. Got, we've got great ideas. We're just trying to figure out. It's like, those are great ideas, but they're not the idea. Wow. And gluttony, gluttony ended up being like off the, in my opinion, off the charts phenomenal. What is it? I have a guy, a friend of mine, he's a black guy, he's a fitness trainer, he's an, also an actor, and he has a big beard, very unique That's look. That's the 30-30 guy, right? Or the yes. 6 uh, yeah. Yes. And I said, so imagine that you have twine, like bales of hay twine, like from the Midwest when they would have those, those smaller bales that you could handle, not these huge ones. And like that kind of twine that will cut into you unless you're wearing gloves. You have twine tied to your each finger, and that twine is stitched into your lips. So I said, contort your mouth like you're pulling. So he'd be like pulling and have his mouth like try to contort like he's pulling. So then in Photoshop, I can just contort it just a little bit more. Oh, wow. Because I don't want it to look stupid. But I want it to look like, holy shit, right? Yeah. So his mouth is stitched shut. And he's got this look of panic on his face. And these strings are attached to his fingers with the stitches, which means he can't ingest anything. Wow. And there's no food in the picture. It's a simple, clean, like dramatically lit. Is, is this going to be like a coffee table book, or what's it going to be? It's going to be a set. It's going to be a, my my plan is to make it a set um, of eleven and a half by fourteens. So you know, like a little bit bigger. Well, I guess that's legal size, but on photo paper. And then to have them all, seven of them, their individual copy, but very similar in theme of of like the surrounding and the darkness. And then just framed the same way, like something antique or archaic, kind of appropriate for everything. And just at the bottom, you know, I said I still got to pick a font that works. Uh, just put the one word. And if it's gluttony, just put gluttony and nothing else. Now, wow. you put the word there, it's going to influence somebody. It's going to steer them a direction. Yeah. If you don't put the word there, it can be anything. Yeah. So it, it, there's no right or wrong, but for my self-assignment project, yes, I'm putting the word there because this is my project. And then, you know, I'll put them online so people can buy them individually um, or they can buy them as a set. But what, is your web, what is your website, by the way? Let's plug it, that, too. It, it's my name. It's TonyMandrich.com. TonyMandrich.com. Um, yeah, M-A-N-D-A-R-I-C-H. We'll include it in here as well. And um, and and there's you know there's stuff on there like you know like you'll you'll see it's a lot of the, I'd say eighty percent of the stuff on that website is composited meaning um, it's been you'll see what the composite is because you'll see picture of a girl in a cowboy hat with a white wall behind her and then in that same picture it's like one picture the bottom half of the picture is the same as the top half except it's composited into a scene. Where she's on a desert highway with an old broken down pickup truck with these ravens on the truck, and she's looking back. That's cool, man. And I put a fan on one side, so when she's looking back, her hair is blowing across her face to sell it more. Like you sell it, right? Yeah. You sell the realism, but yeah. you know it's. But I wanted people to see 
that you can really, really create anything. It's what's here is what's it's what the creativity so is. Cool. It, it's and it's never boring. But and, it's and obviously, you're very passionate about it. Yeah. And, um, and, and the, how long and have you been doing it, by the way? How long professional, you professionally since '05. Okay. But I've been shooting like you know long before that as a serious hobbyist. Fourteen years old, like professionally. Yeah, and most of that professional like was has been like commercial advertising photography. So, but it's like, but I've also done a lot of what I love to do, and that's why my website is. This is what I want to attract. This kind of work. I want people that want this kind of work. I want that regular portrait to scream an emotion. And so it's, there's a lot of dialogue between me and the client long before the shoot. The, the shortest thing of the whole shoot is the actual shoot. There's more rapport building, and no, I, I've never seen anybody talk about it in a book or anywhere, and it, and it might be somewhere, but I've never read it. One, in my opinion, one of the most important things, and this is assuming by default you're a good photographer, at least have the good basic skills and some creativity, and everybody's got that, that you build rapport with that person so they get comfortable with you and they trust you. Because if you can get them to trust you and not con them into trusting you, just be yourself. Show them your vulnerabilities so they can show you theirs. And and the biggest thing is that, you know, sometimes a, a woman will say, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a model and I'm sure you shoot, you know, like the women on your website are beautiful and stuff. And I said, 99%, 95% of the people I shoot um, are not models for a living. They're people like you and I. I said, we, we just uh, find out what you want, what you want to express, what you want. I always talk about the emotion part. What do you want this image to feel? Not, I just want to know, what when somebody looks at this, what do you want it to say without any letters on it? And yeah, and all your stuff that's on here is so cool, man. We're going to include a bunch of these. Uh, images and stuff like that. It's in the list. I just and, every, and and those are all my life experiences. Now, and the great thing, this is the great thing about creativity. Your life experiences, a lot of them are the same as mine, but a lot of them are different. You'll get different things out of different images. Yeah. You know, which is great, and so will other people. And and you know, that's one of the yeah, things. That's up great. There. So. Well, you know, I could like I said when we talked on the phone the very first time. You know, I, I you're. I know you and I can sit down and talk for hours and hours and hours about everything, but uh, I, you know, I, I just appreciate the time. I know that you're, you know, running a company and everything like that, and it's obvious about not only how, um, you know, I guess I'd just say about how caring you are about. It, it comes back, like you said, to the cliche about you know each if it helps each it, one person, but. I'm always reminded of that starfish thing, you know. It matter, you know, the, for those that don't know that, the father and son walking down the beach, and you know, well, and all the starfish are grounded and whatnot like that, right? And the kids throwing it in, the dad's like, doesn't do anything. Well, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters to that one. Exactly. So, we really do feel our little mantra is if we can help one person. Stay sober for, yep. or take a step even to staying sober for one more day, yep. then we will feel like uh, it's a pretty low bar, actually, you know, but it's very, very valuable because everybody's precious, man. Like, everybody there's a song matters. And somebody, right? Every, you got some song. Everybody matters. Yeah, um, man. Like, everybody matters. Every single person matters, and it's so important. And I always look at it worst case scenario. You and I are sober because yeah. of the conversation. Yeah, and, and I know that that's it's going to go way beyond that. The reach well, is going to go way beyond that. And it's true. I mean, as you're talking about like passion for this and that, and I really respect you for you know, hey, I, I walk away from some six feet because, and, and really, in fact, I'm probably going to pull out a pad of paper and write down. But it's interesting for me, like literally, I introduce you, and I've, I've talked to a lot of really amazing people also and 
And I think to myself, like, I just love what I do. Like, how do who gets to talk to guys like right. this and have a conversation like this? Like, it's so right. cool, man. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's what I like to do. This is the kind of thing I love doing in our magazine. I love all of our subscribers. Truly, um, I think every one of our guests is, that comes on is feels the same way. I mean, what's not to like, man? So, it, it, you know. I, obviously now I'm a subscriber and I have gone through a lot of the stuff. I've downloaded the app on my phone and and you know caught myself again three hours going by going I got to stop reading this because I got stuff to do. But then there's that one story of that girl that's a drummer. Oh yeah. Okay. And you know what fascinated the first thing that fascinated me about her was the picture. <laughs> the picture was intense. It was dark. Yeah. She's against that wall, and I'll bet you she was against, I'm not sure, yeah. it looks like she was probably against a white wall that was maybe or even slightly gray, and they composited whatever texture they wanted it, because so. I do it all the time, yeah. and and it's a freaking awesome picture, it's an awesome interview, and it's like one of those things that stops you in your tracks, especially since I related earlier, music is a driver for me. Yeah. You know, it just like makes my, you know... Blood just go. I think you're the first guest we've ever had that's actually really given a plug back to them that's been that enthusiastic. So I, I appreciate that. I, I work very much on uh, affirmation, and so does all of our team. Everybody from uh, some people come and contribute to the magazine occasionally once a month. Right. We've got people that contribute on a month by month basis. But I know personally, like, I just look to kill myself to make sure that the final product that goes out is. You know, like it's, it's first class. I can tell you that it's first class. I mean, when I go through it, I'm like, this is first class work here. Like, it's quality content and first class the way it's put together. It's not just some guy that is like, I think I know how to do this PDF magazine, or mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yep. It's like you can tell that this is a different level. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, we probably should wrap up. We've been on for a little while, but, um, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, we're going to be friends, man. Um, I appreciate it. You've yeah. got my info, and, and, and I appreciate it, and I'm grateful that you guys even considered having yeah. me on. Um, I'm going to have a lot of new fans, but you and I are going to be friends. So We already are, and I like my ribeye medium well. <laughs> all right everybody well thanks for listening in i hope you got one nugget there was lots and lots and lots of nuggets here this has been another really awesome for me for you i, I think for tony for whoever uh, interview and tony uh, mandrich uh, thank you for your time and for just giving so selflessly to everybody so hang on one sec i'm going to stop the interview and then we can chat for just a second and i'll be right back <laughs>